getting into the material here, though, um, it mentions in the book that the role of the paramedic was created to provide early treatment for patients with AMI. That is somewhat true. Um, there, there's some other reasons why a paramedic was created and that role was created. And it's been a little bit more than 40 years, but one of the things that we noticed was is that there was a lot of preventable diseases, traumas being one of the main ones, that, that were occurring before that patient got to the hospital. And, and not getting into a big history lesson here, but you know, you should know the history of EMS and essentially it started out with if you had an emergency, eventually you were gonna get picked up either by the funeral home or the police department in the paddy wagon. And the funeral home, they were going to throw you in the back and if you were uh, dead by the time they passed the funeral home, they were gonna swerve off and go to the funeral home. And if you were still alive, then they were taking you to the hospital. Definitely not the same type of system that we have now. But what we noticed is, is that there was a lot of preventable diseases such as AMI and traumatic accidents and things like that that were, or a lot of preventable deaths that were occurring that, that shouldn't be. Um, one of the main reasons why this is foundational for us, and it really is the mainstay of paramedic, cardiology and trauma are your, your, your two main things where you're expected to be very proficient in. Now, of course, you're expected to be proficient in the other areas as well, but cardiology and trauma is, is where you're expected to be expert level at um, for the role of a paramedic. And it's simply for the fact that there's a lot of people with cardiac issues these days. There's a lot of tools available to help us identify these cardiac issues, and there's a lot of treatments available that we can perform in the field to help with that. Um, one person has an uh, AMI or acute myocardial infarction in the United States about every 40 seconds. That's a pretty strong statistic there, okay? Now, a lot of them, folks have AMIs. Now, that, that's kind of a misleading statistic when we say, you know, one person every 40 seconds has one. It kind of makes you believe that every 40 seconds somebody's falling over dead with a uh, heart attack, and that's not entirely true. Basically what it's saying is, is that somebody has a AMI, whether it is a silent one, there's situations where people will have an AMI and they never even know it, versus you know someone that has the big one and they fall out. Um, in the United States, EMS personnel treat about 60% of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest each year. I keep telling myself that I'm actually going to look up the statistics of those 60%, how many actually have you know survivability rates. It's probably not going to be that big, all right? But the thing is, is that we're going to do all that we can with what we have. The mainstay with your treatment in the field across the board, whether it's cardiac, medical, trauma, or whatever, is going to be your ability to formulate a treatment plan based off of your clinical judgment and your critical thinking skills. You're going to be a healthcare professional. You should not view yourself any other way than a healthcare professional. You're not an emergency medical technician anymore. A technician is somebody that is very skills oriented. You take a piece of paper, you do check off sheets, and you're able to do this step, this step, this step, this step, task oriented. Whereas a healthcare professional is critical thinking oriented. Meaning that we're going to be problem solvers. We're gonna be presented with a problem and we're gonna have to work out a solution. We're going to have to figure out what it is that we need to do so that we can make the next steps to get that patient what they need across the board. And that's where this comes from. So an age-old question I always like to ask, do you diagnose in the field as a paramedic? Do you diagnose in the field? What? Absolutely. How else are you going to treat a patient? What does the doctor have to do in order to form a treatment plan for that patient? He or she has to make a diagnosis, right? Now, is that diagnosis going to follow them? Are we the one that's given their official diagnosis? No, it's not going to do that. But what it is going to do, that field diagnosis is going to give us a, a formula or a part of the formula so that we can fill out the treatment plan in our head. Does that make sense? And that's what our goal is. Now, i got some more statistics here that I want to share with you. Coronary artery disease. So we know that we have arteries in the body, right? Arteries are going to be your oxygen-carrying vessels. Coronary arteries 
are a special group of arteries, right? They supply what? Blood to the heart. Blood to the heart. That's it. That's their main job, right? But they're very susceptible to a lot of the disease processes, uh, atherosclerosis, um, the plaque formation, uh, also because they're smaller lumen and they're very close to central circulation, something like a uh, pulmonary embolism or even a DVT or something like that. They, it can get back into that system. Um, coronary artery disease is your most common type of heart disease. There's lots of people walking around right now that may have, you know, 80% um, occlusion of their coronary artery and they don't know it. They just know that they feel like crap all the time, right? Um, and then there's the people that have the full-on occlusion and we have the, the MI. Um, it killed 365,914 people in 2017. Now that was three years ago, but that was the most updated uh, information I could find on the CDC. 18.2 million adults over 20 years of age. Two in 10 deaths from CAD are adults younger than 65. So the, the point that I make here is that you're gonna be presented in situations where maybe they don't quite fit the mold. Maybe this patient is not going to be the textbook. Patients don't read a textbook. <clears throat> the body doesn't read the textbook. The body does what it does in response to a stress, right? They may not always read the textbook, but you're able to read the patient. You're able to perform an assessment. You're able to get these clues, right? Two in 10 deaths from CAD are adults younger than 65. So that could be the middle-aged man that's 45 years old that is a smoker and a drinker and he's, under a, he's at a high-stress job under a lot of stress and eats a 99 cent heart attack every day for lunch and he thinks that he just has indigestion and he's had indigestion for three days and he's went through two bottles of Tums and he's not any better, right? Or it could be that, that 50 year old female who doesn't have any type of symptoms and she was just out raking leaves and she just notices that she's not feeling well or her, her back is hurting and she goes into the hospital and she was having an active MI. That's a real patient that I had. She never knew that she was having this situation, but she was young, right? And, and if she wouldn't have taken it upon herself to just go get her muscle strain that she thought she was having in her back checked out, she would have had a cardiac arrest in the middle of her home, right? And so again, my, my point here is that these things affect more than just old folks, right? As a matter of fact, the ages are getting younger and younger as we're getting unhealthier and unhealthier. Now, I know that I stand before you not as a picture-perfect presentation of health, all right? So again, uh, this is one of those situations where I'm preaching about something and I really know that I should do differently as well. Heart attack. So of course, we've got a difference in coronary artery disease. Now, coronary artery disease in itself can actually restrict the person's quality of life. It can cause issues. But then we get into heart attack where you've got around 805,000 in America each year, 605,000 are first time. So the other 200,000 or so that you have every year are second, third, fourth. They've already had a, a coronary artery bypass or maybe they've been in the, uh, the cath lab and they had a stent put in or, or something like that. Um, one in five are silent, silent MIs. These are, are MIs that they never know. And as a matter of fact, they may not even get checked out and they may have, have gotten a stress test or something like that. And the doctor picks up on their uh, EKG that there's some, some um, areas of infarct on their, their EKG or their echocardiogram or something like that where they might have had this two years ago. They're lucky, they're very lucky. Right? My point being is, is that we need to understand that this is a big issue that affects the population that you're going to serve. This class is not just about reading some squiggly lines on a monitor. This class is about learning how to determine that cardiac patient's issue and treating that patient accordingly. Because sometimes you may have a cardiac patient that gives you the most beautiful normal sinus rhythm you've ever seen on a monitor, right? 
Or sometimes you may have that patient that may be um, saying, hey, I just don't feel real good, but there's no reason for you to think cardiac, and you put them on the monitor, and oh, Lordy Jesus, is the big one that they're having, right? And so, again, that's where we want to develop our critical thinking skills. That's where we work in lab, and that's why we do it in here. Proven factors to increase risk. Most of these up here, I don't even have to tell you. We know as a society, smoking's bad for you, right? Uh, McDonald's is bad for you. Wendy's is bad for you. Our high stress, that's bad for you, right? But what about some of these other things? Male gender. Male gender. Um, what about family history? Woo. Some of these things are, are, are things biologically you cannot change. And that still makes you susceptible. Those are called intrinsic risk factors versus extrinsic risk factors. Extrinsic risk factors are what we would call modifiable risk factors, meaning that we could change those while we still have time. And when I say we, I mean society as a whole. Uh, smoking, <laughs> cocaine use. Rick James says that's a heck of a drug. Hypertension. Now, some people do have chronic hypertension, genetic hypertension, but I would say most of the cases of hypertension in America now is because of high sodium and because of lack of exercise. It all works together. You learned in advanced EMT school the, the, the very basis of life, right? You start with a cell, then you go to what? The cells make organs, organs make systems, right? And, and then the systems make the organism. It all works together. It all works together. And there's not a single cell in the body that is not going to be affected by some of these activities that we uh, take part in. Now, some of these factors that are thought to increase risk, and I think they're just trying to be PC here because really and truly, again, we know that this diet, it ain't helping. We know that being several hundred pounds overweight, that ain't helping, right? Um, oral contraceptives, birth control pills. Um, I'm, there's a much higher incidence of pulmonary embolism with oral contraceptives, but these are things that they have seen to thought to increase risk. Type A personality. What's a type A personality? Huh? The go getter. Yes, it's that go getter. Um, it's, it's that extroverted type of personality. Now, I refer to myself as a type A when I need to be. Um, I've, I've chosen a life uh, since I graduated high school in public service or in healthcare, and so we got to be type A in, in those situations, right? And then I also describe myself as a type B when I want to be left alone, just leave me alone. I may not talk to you for a week, but just leave me alone, you know? I guess some folks may call that moody, I don't know. But my point being is, is that that type A personality, that, that go-getter, that, that hey, y'all watch this kind of personality, activates the sympathetic nervous system a lot. We can also call those people high strung, right? Or in some cases, right? Um, type A personalities typically are not able to manage stress as healthy as a type B personality is, right? And it is proven science that stress has a direct physiological um, effect on the body. They do stress tests at, at the hospital, right? Or at the cardiologist's office. They, they put the heart under stress to see how it copes, right? A heart under stress for a lot of situations for a long time is not gonna cope very well. And then, of course, psychosocial tensions, stress. I can't say enough in, uh, about stress in, in this field and really in life in general right now under a, a pandemic. It's very stressful. Right? Um, as a paramedic student, it's very stressful. Y'all better not have an MI on me. All right? If you have an MI, wait till Wednesday night or Thursday night when I'm not here. All right? Um, what are some of the things that we do? Now, one of the things that you'll hear a lot in this class and in trauma is that the first step to treatment is prevention. Right? Well, we'll be out of a job if we prevent everything. No, there's always going to be people that say, hey, y'all, watch this. There's always going to be people that jump off moving vehicles and crazy stuff like that. And there's always going to be sick people. But if we can target the population and, and at least start educating about things 
and, and we're doing a good job of it in a lot of aspects, you know. One of the things uh, we used to do, we, we have a little EMS organization, student organization here. It's not as active as it used to be, but uh, the EMS Student Foundation, one of the things we used to do is every October at the Lee County Fair comes to town, they have a little exhibition hall. And we would take CPR mannequins and students would sit up there every night for a week and I'd sit with them and all. And we would just teach the public how to do hands-only CPR. There's commercials on TV during prime time. Have y'all ever noticed, uh, maybe not during prime time, but the, during the day you watch an old Matlock uh, rerun or I don't know, whatever you watch. Uh, but on those channels like TBS that show the reruns and stuff, those commercials, they're just like old people driven, you know, like uh, uh, if you self catheterize yourself or you can get your diabetic testing supplies from Liberty or whatever. But that is one of the main ways that we target now. Another way now is social media. You, I, I guarantee you that tonight, if you get on Facebook, or I don't know how the others work, but I know on Facebook, all you gotta do is think of something and it's gonna pop up. I guarantee you, you'll see something about healthcare education or public education in that. But um, what we have found is that, that we can provide prevention strategies and there can be things that, that even if it's just a small thing that that person that, that may otherwise suffer a potentially catastrophic event may have been able to prevent. One example I, I think of a lot is is a, a Bayer aspirin commercial, the Bayer brand. Um, there is I saw a commercial I don't know how long ago it's been, and I don't even know I don't watch TV anymore unless it's Paw Patrol or or Peppa Pig, but uh, and they don't usually have heart attack commercials on those, but. Uh, 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 it was a Bayer commercial and it was uh, essentially this person driving down the road and he's telling a story and he's like I started having chest pain and I actually remember watching a commercial, it's kind of weird about Bayer aspirin and I just happened to have my Bayer aspirin in my console there and I popped a couple and it saved my life but that's true, somebody starts feeling chest pain now they'll remember hey let's maybe we can take some aspirin that I felt I mean it's proven, aspirin helps um, and then there's other ways of, of educating as well, um, you know, alteration of lifestyle, that kind of stuff. Uh, but then there's other ways as well, like this next video, where we try to take the shock and all kind of approach. Now this is a, uh, this is a video from England. They'd never put anything like this on American TV, I don't believe. <laughs> So, you're here to find out what it's like to have a, a heart attack. Well, we don't have much time because with heart attacks you never do. Well, let's start with the first symptom most people think of. Yes, chest pains. Well, we've all heard of the classic chest pains, but it may not always be that severe. It could be a bit of tightness or discomfort in and around the chest. No doubt you'll shrug this off. I mean, uh, slight chest discomfort, tightness, oh, not worth worrying about, right? Wrong. What if it spreads to your arms? Still not convinced you're having a heart attack? Well, what if you feel dizzy, lightheaded? Oh, still thinking, don't make a fuss. What if it spreads to your neck, to your jaws? You're probably thinking, tough it out, it will pass. What if it doesn't? The longer you leave it, the more your heart dies. How about difficulty breathing? Rising panic, sweaty, clammy. Could be indigestion, last night's curry. Stress. But what if it's your body telling you to get help? Don't kid yourself. If you're having chest pains or discomfort with any of these symptoms, or even if you're feeling unwell, dial 999. Now this may surprise you. The ambulance service would rather see you and discover it's not a heart attack than arrive too late. Every second counts. I know you think you feel embarrassed if it's not actually a heart attack, but imagine how you'll feel if it is, and you left it too late. Imagine that.
personally think that that's a uh, pretty good way to get the point across. Um, I just wanted to just show you guys that to break up the monotony. Um, we've been going at about an hour, so let's take about a five minute break. Okay. Alright, so uh, I'll give you a little background history on just the, the statistics of why we do this and, and what's to be expected and all that. So let's go back into cardiology review here and um, we're going to hit on some new things. Alright, so we're getting into the cardiovascular system and so I may mention just a minute ago about how organs go into systems right, and then systems work together, right? And so we know that the, the cardiovascular system, it is, number one, a, a pump and pipes. Number two is a closed system. It has to stay closed. Number three, it's a highway. It delivers to the cells and it transports away from the cells, right? That's its main job. There's two things that makes the heart work the way it is, or it does. The electrical system and the mechanical system. Just as important as it is for you to learn how to read cardiac rhythms and arrhythmias, which is a visual representation of the electrical conduction system, you've got to understand how the mechanical system works too. And I'm not just talking about love, dub, pump, pump. I'm talking about how the pressures affect, the pressures coming back to the heart, the pressures going away from the heart, arterial wall pressures, all of these different things. You've got to understand the mechanics of how the heart works. And I'm going to do my best to explain it in a way that, that makes more sense. So we are going to get a little bit deeper with some new terms tonight that, that you've not had before. Okay? And so you need to make sure that you hang on to those terms as we bring them up because they're going to come back up. Everything that I talk about tonight will come back up almost every night that we work in this classroom. Um, we know that, that the cells, they need lots of things. They need nutrients. They need, they need all this. But there's two main things the cells need, and that's oxygen and glucose, right? The blood delivers both of those. The heart, the cells of the heart needs several things, right? With oxygen and glucose being two big things, right? With oxygen being very important, right? If the heart doesn't get these, the rest of the body doesn't get them. The, uh, the heart is, is essentially your driving, your driving force behind the cardiovascular system, right? It's got to have a pump. We've got to be able to move this blood round and round. Um, your heart, it, it sits above the diaphragm <clears throat> just to the left of your uh, sternum. So it sits above the diaphragm, just to the left of your sternum. Take your fist, everybody raise your hand, close it, put it right there. That's about the size of your heart. So the average human heart is about the size of that person's fist. Now you get some big hand person that is on a little bitty person, if their heart's as big as their hand, then they've got some other issues, right? But it's about the size of the fist. Now, got a question for you. Basic, just a basic question. How much blood is in the average person at any point? How many liters? Around five to six, right? This says circulates seven to nine thousand thousand liters of blood daily. All right. So we said there's five to six liters of blood. This circulates. 7,000 to 9,000 liters. Essentially, the heart circulates the complete blood supply in the body every minute. So if you're a person that has five liters of blood, every minute, every liter of blood is going to circulate through your atria and your ventricles. That's why it is absolutely so important for us to be able to determine cardiac issues and be able to help 
get the heart pumping better. And we have drugs that can do that. We have things that can do that. When the body is depending on our complete supply of blood to be circulated around the body every minute, we don't have a lot of time to play with that, right? Um, you've got, within the heart itself, you, let me back up. Within the heart itself, you've got your large vessels, and you've got your smaller vessels, you've got your coronary arteries, you've got your coronary veins, because oxygenated blood goes to the cells, deoxygenated blood has to return back, right? You've also got your main vessels that supply the heart with deoxygenated blood so that it can go through the process of oxygenation at the lungs. And then you've got your large vessels that take blood away from the heart, right? You've got your vena cava, and then you've got your aorta. The heart wall itself, your heart wall itself is surrounded by the pericardium. You all ever heard of pericardial tamponade, things like that, right? So you've got the pericardium that surrounds the heart. Now, there's two layers of that um, pericardium. You've got the parietal pericardium and the visceral pericardium. Now, this is my heart. This is the way I'm always going to draw a heart because I'm not an artist. But within the heart itself, so let me get within the or the outside of the heart, you've got your two layers, right? So you've got that layer, and then you've got this layer. And then within those layers, you have pericardial fluid, right? Now, most of your organs have this membranous, mem membranous, if that's word, uh, sac around, like the lungs. They've got the the pleural, right? So you've got the visceral and the parietal. Which one is laying on top of the organ? The visceral and the parietal is on the outside. So the way that I remember that is that my visceral is very close, very close to the organ. And then I remember that my parietal pushes away from the organ. So that would be the same with your visceral pleura and your parietal pleura, right? So your pericardium, it has that fluid that's in the middle of it, and it's going to be important that we revisit this a little bit later, but that fluid on the inside of the, the, of the, the visceral and the parietal layer, it actually provides a lubricant, right? It helps the, the stretch muscles, the stretch fibers of the heart perform even better. So once you get down to the actual muscular layer or the, the innards, innards of the heart, I ordered a human heart and I think they sent me a whale heart, but let's just use this, it's a little easier to carry around. You've got three layers of uh, the wall of the heart. So the epicardium epicardium, that's going to be your outside, so this is going to be under the visceral layer of the heart, but you've got the epicardium, and it's, it's pictured here as this white layer, and then you've got the myocardium. Now, the myocardium, if you, you think of myocardium, myocardial cells are muscle, all right? So your myocardial cells is muscle that's your muscular layer the myocardium has a mechanical function its function is to stretch and it's very dependent the heart's very dependent on the myocardial layer being able to stretch that's why something like a myocardial infarction is very bad right because what's infarction that is tissue death and so if the the cell dies it's not able to 
stretch. The heart's very dependent on that. And then you've got your endocardium or your insides. So I just think endo inside. Okay? All three of those layers can have issues. You can have epicarditis, endocarditis, myocarditis. You can have myocardial infarction, myocardial ischemia. All of those layers can be affected. Okay? Now, they, the, the inside, now if you remember from anatomy, even from high school anatomy, you know that heart cells are very specialized, right? They have both muscle and, or they, they have um, both uh, smooth muscle properties, right? And they also have like movement as well. What, what is the purpose of the smooth muscle? to get bigger and smaller, right? Your vessels, they, they have smooth muscle on the inside of your vessels, your arteries, right? So they can get bigger and small. And so that's what this is, is, is made of. It's made of, of cardiac tissue, which is specialized, but it has those properties, all right? Um, the epicardium protects the heart by reducing friction. The myocardium is your muscle tissue, and then the endocardium is made up of epithelial and connective tissue, and the lining is continu continuous with the innermost lining of the blood vessels of the body, meaning that it's essentially made of, of the same type of material that the rest of the vessels are, and again, to go back to that function that I just mentioned just a minute ago. So cardiac muscle is unique uh, to the heart. Now, I mentioned that just a minute ago. One of the things that makes it very unique is that each one of the cardiac cells come together and form a gap at a gap um, at what's called a intercalated disc. These, these intercalated discs allows the heart to essentially transmit electrical conduction and then receive that contractile force all together at one time. And essentially, we're going to come back to this term in a little bit, but work in what's called a syncytium where essentially they will all contract together. It's very, very important that the heart contracts together. The atria contact, contracts together and the ventricles contract together. Now, have you ever been in the ER, maybe you did ER clinicals or maybe you were on a, um, you took a patient in on the ambulance or something like that and they were having chest pain and they said that they were going to draw a troponin on them. So a troponin and uh, tropomycin, these are both um, these are both chemicals that are that are produced. Um, and when troponins are raised, or their enzymes, I was thinking of trying to think of that word. But um, when when troponin levels are raised, that shows that there's an issue with the muscle tissue itself, and so that's why they draw those to see if the muscle tissue has been affected. Okay. Um, Cardiac muscles, they're long branching cells that fit together tightly again at those intercalated discs, and then they, the discs form the gap functions, which allows everything to contract at the same time, like I had already mentioned. So now, getting into the actual, just the, the heart itself, just talking about the organ itself. The, the heart, it's got four chambers, right? Your right atria, your little... Le uh, I'm sorry, your right atria, your right ventricle, your left atria, and your left ventricle. All right? So it's one organ, right? And it functions as a pump. Just as if you think about, I had one of those little blow up blue ring pools for my kids last summer, and it had a little pump that we had. It came out and it went back in, right? A full pump. It goes out and comes back in. How does that water get? get into the pump. The pump actually has to create that pumping force, right? It has to get primed to come through. That's what the heart does. However, you've got to start thinking of the heart as not one pump, but two pumps. You've got a low pressure pump and a high pressure pump. So essentially what you need to do is think of the heart as one organ, but two pumping functions, okay? You've got your right side, low pressure, which pumps blood through the pulmonary artery. 
not a very long ways. It doesn't have to pump it very hard, but it pumps it to the pulmonary arteries so that we can perform uh, external respiration, right? Blood picks up the oxygen, uh, unloads the carbon dioxide and all that. And then it comes back into the left side. Now the left side, both of the chambers, both of the chambers hold about the same amount of blood but the right side doesn't have to work near as hard because it doesn't have as much force to push against, right? The left side has to work much harder. So even on this model here, what do you notice about the myocardial tissue on the left side versus the right side? Bigger, bigger line. Hmm? It's bigger. Absolutely. The left side, the inside is about the same size, but the muscle is much bigger on the left side. Muscle's much bigger on the left side. Why? Because it pumps more blood through the body. It's yeah. It works harder. Yeah, it works harder and it's pumping blood through the body, right? So the right side has to pump through through the uh, pulmonic valve, through the pulmonary artery. Now we measure pressures within the vessels in millimeters of mercury, right? What's normal blood pressure? 120 over 80. 120 over 80. You went on an ambulance call and you forgot to take a blood pressure, but the PCR needs you to do a blood pressure, so what's that patient got? 120 over 80, right? Respirations are about 18. They look like they're breathing all right. I, I'm just joking about that, but normal blood pressure is 120 over 80, right? The PA pressures, the, the, the systolic pressure in the pulmonary artery is usually around low teens, around 14, 15, 16 millimeters of mercury, whereas the arterial blood pressure is 120 systolic. Now again, the, the systolic is what we're pushing against, right? So if you think of the low teens versus 120, that's a much higher pressure, right? So the left side has to pump against a much higher pressure. So that's why you've got two pumps. And it's by design to function exactly that way. The body is dependent on the left side, but the right side, even though it doesn't work as hard, is just as important as the left side, okay? So the right side is your low pressure pump. So your, um, your su superior vena cava collects blood from the upper body, then the inferior vena cava collects from the lower body, and then what do we do? We dump it into the right atrium, right? And then, um, it goes through the circulation there and then it gets into the left side where the uh, pulmonary veins collect blood from the lungs. So pulmonary artery actually is the only artery in the human body, in the adult human body, that carries deoxygenated blood. Well then why is it called an artery? Because it actually carries blood away from the heart. So arteries carry blood away from the heart, right? It's not a high pump, a high pressure, but it is the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary vein actually receives the oxygenated blood from the capillaries, the alveolar capillary bed, back into that area, and then it drops it off at the left atrium. Within the heart, you've got to keep a forward flow of blood, all right? So um, if you, you think about a pipe and you're pushing water through, but you don't want that water to come back. You want it to just keep going forward. What do you have to have? There has to be a valve. There has to be a stop there, right? Now, in hoses, you can actually have one-way valves, right? You can have a valve that pushes forward, but it doesn't allow it to come back. And that's kind of the way this works, but it actually takes a little more of an active process with your heart valves. So you've got two types of valves within the heart. You've got four valves, two of one kind, two of the other. You've got your atrioventricular valves. So if you know the way anatomy works, and if you know the way um, medical terminology works, most things in medical, if you know medical terminology, you can kind of figure out. So the AV valves, atrioventricular valves, are going to sit where? Exactly, between the atria and the ventricles, right? Then you've got, these are a little harder to remember, but you've got the semi-lunar valves. 
the semilunar valves are actually the pulmonic valve and the aortic valve. So again, if we can use deductive reason in here, we would know that the pulmonic valve is going to be in front of the what? Pulmonary artery, and the aortic valve is going to be in front of what? The aorta, right? So you've got to keep that forward flow of blood. If you don't, you're going to have what's called regurgitation or movement of blood backwards. That doesn't work very well for the body. It doesn't work very well for a pump either. If you know anything about the way a pump works, it has to stay primed in order to continue to move forward, right? How many firefighters have got in here? All right, so you know how a pump works on a pumper, right? You have to hook it up, you have to turn the pump on, and you've got to keep that continual pump. If at any time that pump starts to lose pressure, you stop losing supply, right? It's the same thing here. If at any time our pump stops losing pressure, we have we lose supply now what happens if you notice that the pump is starting to lose pressure on your pumper you're going to start kicking the pressure up a little more on the pumper right you're going to try to figure out things that you need to do in order to continue that flow through the body and that's the way the heart works as well through intrinsic things that the heart does to compensate getting the, the, the horse way ahead of the cart, which is what's supposed to happen, the cart ahead of the horse, uh, but your tricuspid valve. Your tricuspid valve is an AV valve or atrioventricular valve that's between the right atria and the right ventricle. Why is it called a tricuspid valve? Yeah. You can't see it real good because they're attached, but this is your tricuspid valve here and it has three flaps, tri, three, all right? Your mitral valve is also known as your bicuspid valve. So tri, bi would mean it's got two cusps, right? And that's between the left side. Now, the, the valves themselves are attached to papillary muscle by what's called the chordae tendinae. The chordae tendinae. Anybody ever pulled on your heartstrings? If they did, you'd be dead because your valves would be opened up. That's what the heartstrings are, are your chordae tendinae, okay? Again, what's the main purpose here? To prevent regurgitation. So if we, if we have regurgitation in the right side, if the, if the tricuspid valve doesn't work, that blood has to go somewhere, right? Because the pressure is going to build up as it goes backwards. Where is it going to go? Not the lungs. Not the lungs. The right side, the body, is going to go to the, the, the periphery, right? That's, that's what the right side does. Now, the left side, if you have that mitral valve regurge, you ever heard of somebody said they have mitral valve prolapse? Well, that's what happens is that the mitral valve, the, the valve there, prolapsed or it doesn't close all the way and it actually has that regurgitation that goes back and then, then it will go back into the pulmonary uh, vasculature in the system, right? We don't want that. We want forward flow of blood. So those valves are very, very important. Then you get, you get the semilunar valve. Why is it called a semilunar? Lunar. What does lunar mean? Like a moon, right? Lunar moon. So somebody looked at these valves one time, and they're like, "Hey, that kind of looks like a half moon." I don't see it, but they say it kind of does. So they call them the semilunar valves. So the semilunar valves, you've got your pulmonic semilunar valve that goes from the right side into the right. Um, or the, uh, the pulmonary artery, and then you've got your aortic semilunar valve that the left ventricle has to push and it has to actually overcome the pressure in the aorta in order to open that up and to push it all the way through. This is a, a little bit better view there. These are the, the, the semilunar valves, and I guess I can see it a little more there, and then these are actually your bicuspid, so you've got one, two, three cusps, that's your tricuspid, and your bicuspid is one, two, all right? Now, 
How do I remember that the tricuspid's on the right? What now? There's three lobes on the right side of the lungs. Okay, that is one way to remember it. There's three lobes on the right side of the lungs. Um, the way I remember it is, is that I try before I buy. Or I try to do right. I always try to do right. So tricuspids on the right. Now, the other thing, the way that I remember your mitral, If I look on the left side of the mitral word, there's big L there. So my mitral's on my left side, my tricuspid's on the right, okay? So how do I remember how the blood goes through? I'm gonna tissue paper my assets. Tissue paper my assets. Tricuspid's on the right, paper, pulmonic, mitral, and then aortic. That's a slide that I had from nursing school. Okay, any questions on the valves? Any questions on the myocardial muscle or anything like that? All right, let's move on. Coronary circulation, the most important circulatory system in the body. Why? Because if it's not functioning, nothing else in the body is functioning. Heart is supplied with oxygenated blood by the coronary arteries. If something happens to the coronary arteries, it shuts everything down. Heart receives its supply before the rest of the body. When does the heart receive its blood? Before the rest of the body. Yep. When does the body receive its blood? During systole or diastole? Systole. The heart receives its blood during diastole. Because the heart's working so hard to get pump, blood pumped out everywhere else, that during systole, all of its focus is trying to get everything else out. During diastole, it's trying to get replenished for the next cardiac cycle. Make sense? So, your coronary arteries, and I don't really have a good model with the coronary arteries, yeah, I really don't. Your coronary arteries, they branch off into two big arteries. You've got your left main coronary artery, or your LMCA, and your right main coronary artery. Now, you may have heard the left main called the Widowmaker before. The, uh, the Widowmaker, or the left main, is actually the largest in diameter, but the shortest in length. As soon as it starts, it, it pretty quickly branches off into your left descending and your circumflex arteries. So it divides into the left anterior descending and the circumflex. And then both of those, they branch, you've got more arteries, and, and I'm not gonna go into all the names of, of all the ones, I don't really care, that, I mean, I don't really care that you know like all the small coronary arteries, but you do need to understand about the left and the right and how they branch off. Now, why is it, um, why is the left uh, coronary artery called the widow? Hmm? It'll kill you faster. It'll kill you faster, that's right. If you notice here, it's not a great picture. Maybe I can back up. Yeah, let's use this one right here. So this would be my right and this would be my left. Alright, so if you notice here that it it starts out my left main and then it branches to my um, my circumflex and my left anterior descending, and then it branches even further. If I get what's called a high arterial clot, if I get a thrombus up here, I've cut off 80% of the blood flow to the heart. Your left main, in, in everybody's anatomy is a little different, but it, it usually supplies around 80% of the blood flow to the heart. So essentially, 
It's not 100% guaranteed, but if you get 100% occlusion of your left main, you're not going to fare well. So that's, that's one of the reasons why they call it the wheel maker. All right. Um, so then the right coronary artery, it actually, um, the right coronary artery travels between the right atrium and the right ventricle by way of the um, atrioventricular groove. So in this picture, this is an anterior view of the heart. This would actually be your uh, right atria right here, and this would be your ventricle. So the heart, again, is more lean than it is actually sitting upright, which it's the way that we think of it a lot of times, but it actually is more lean. Um, and if, if I'm in the way, y'all tell me, because I want y'all to see. But um, there is this groove right here where essentially it's just designed for it to sit into. All right? Um, the, the right branches, and it supplies all the right atrium and the right ventricle, and a portion of the inferior part of the left ventricle and portions of the conduction system. Moving forward, we're going to, to have to, when we do a 12 lead, we're going to take a, a, a normal 12 lead, like the way I practice putting on the other day. It, it takes a quick look at the, um, the walls of the left yes. ventricle, right? But because the right uh, coronary artery supplies some of the inferior wall of the heart and some of the uh, left ventricle. There's some situations where we actually have to move one lead and put it on the right side so that we can take a look at the right ventricle to see if we've had any issues with the right coronary artery. They're very important. The left side just supplies more blood and so of course we want to make sure that we're not having issues with the left side before we do the right side. Um, there's a lot of uh, connections. So as far as, as the vessels go, you've got your arteries and your arterioles and, and they go into the capillaries and your veins and your venules and it goes into the capillaries. And so um, there's connections between the arterioles of the coronary arteries, um, which are called anastomoses. All right. So these connections right there, they um, allow for the development of alternative routes of blood flow. What do you notice here? Now this is just a, a picture. We removed the uh, we moved all the tissue of the heart, and we've just got the coronary vessels. There's pretty much no area of the heart that's not touched by some arterial ar artery or arterial or something like that, right? But the body has an awesome way of rerouting blood flow. To an extent and that's called collateral flow so let's say that one of these small vessels here got a blockage well because we've got so many anastomoses or connections there we're actually able to bypass that naturally to a degree now it's not a great way to live right I mean we want full blood flow everywhere but it's a way to try to keep ourselves alive right so that's called collateral flow or collateral circulation Then the arteries in the main coronary vein cross the heart in a groove called the coronary sulcus, or the, the, the AV groove, and then venous blood empties into the coronary sinus. So like I mentioned earlier, you've got atrial blood flow, coronary artery, not atrial, but coronary artery, arterial blood flow that, that delivers oxygenated blood to the tissues, right? But something has to pick up that oxygenated blood and bring it back, right? And so your, 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 your coronary veins pick up that deoxygenated blood. But now they don't flow into the inferior and superior vena cava. They actually flow back directly into the atria by way of the coronary sulcus. That's what it's called. Okay? So I've kind of went through that right there. I guess gotta move forward. I've gotta have these pictures here. All right.
So you're, th there's two distinct circulatory systems when it comes to the cardiac system. You've got your coronary system, and then you've got your peripheral circulation. And this is where we take it to everything that's not the heart. And of course we know that the arteries carry oxygenated blood, veins carry the oxygenated blood, and capillaries separate the arteries and the veins. So the capillaries are the site of delivery, right? But well then, before you actually get to the capillaries on the arterial side, you've got arterioles, which are able to, to actually, in some areas, um, control the flow of blood into the capillary beds. And then you've got the venules, or the venules, not the venules, The thing about your arterial system is that it's very, very sensitive to um, pressure changes and it is very sensitive to autonomic uh, nervous system stimulation. What comprises your autonomic nervous system? There's two parts of the autonomic nervous system. Blood pressure. Are you parasympathetic? You got your sympathetic and your parasympathetic, right? And we know that, I mentioned this earlier, that your arterial system and, and your vessels are made of smooth muscle, that they can actually react whenever we have stimulation of the autonomic nervous system to either expand or contract in order to raise or lower blood pressure. Um, when, we, when we check blood pressure, uh, it's actually generated by repeated forceful left ventricular contraction. So our, our peripheral blood pressure is based off of the left ventricle and the force it's, it's going against. Okay. Um, I think we're good there. Yeah. Within the vessel walls, there's three layers. You've got the uh, tunica intima, the tunica media, and the tunica adventitia. Tunica intima, in, is the very most inside. The tunica media, obviously, is going to be the middle. And then you've got the adventitia, which is on the outside. These walls are very, very important to maintain the, the closed system. And they're very important to make the container of the closed system bigger or smaller. And if there's any breach in these walls here, then we have now went to an open system. And what happens whenever you have a system that's under pressure and it becomes open? You lose pressure. That's exactly right. Your arteries and your vessels, all of your vessels, they work directly with the autonomic nervous system. They have to. Within the, the arteries themselves, there's what's called baroreceptors. What does baro mean? Pressure. Pressure, right? So you've got baroreceptors. So what do baroreceptors do? They measure pressure. Pressure, that's right. And these baroreceptors send signals back to the brain to tell the heart, or to tell the, the brain, to tell the rest of the body, we need to raise blood pressure or low, lower blood pressure. So I mentioned you got your two circulations there. This is just uh, showing you the blood flow through the heart. So one of the things that I do want you to be able to review in your mind, because you should have already learned this, is the blood flow from the right side to the left side. So, when blood has been used and deoxygenated, uh, and it picks up the, the waste products, it comes back to the heart via the inferior superior vena cava, right? And then it goes into the, what? The right atrium. The right atrium will then